This video looks at two student learning outcomes that are related to each other. Uh, they are cell metabolism and internal membranes. So we're going to go through and have a bit of a look at why these two are important, uh, both in terms of looking at cell structure, which we did a couple of weeks ago, and cell energy, which we've done a bit more recently. So as we know, the chemical processes going on in a cell are very similar to chemical reactions. There are a lot of chemical reactions, thousands of different chemical reactions that happen inside the cell. When we're doing chemical reactions in a laboratory, we have test tubes in order to uh, keep each of those reactions separate. Inside a cell, we can't have all of the reactions happening in the same compartment. So the cells need to be compartmentalized in order to keep each chemical reaction separate. Otherwise, they're going to react with each other. The other important factor to notice in this is that um, for certain chemicals, in one form they're fairly uh, safe and benign, in other forms they can be uh, toxic or cause trouble within the cell. An example of this would be sodium chloride, for example. So sodium chloride known as table salt, clearly it is safe for us to consume, even safe for the mollusk to consume here. So sod sodium chloride, not harmful to cells. Um, whereas its components of sodium and chlorine, now sodium is highly reactive and will have a violent reaction whenever it touches water. Chlorine also very reactive, causing uh, death to robots uh, and to people. And so um, these two chemicals uh, are very toxic on their own as atomic level, um, but within the compound of sodium uh, chloride, not so bad. So because chemicals change their properties during chemical reactions, again, we need to make sure we can compartmentalize and keep things uh, separate and secure. So when we look at um, a cell, then we can see that it is divided up into lots of different internal areas by the membranes in there. So the cytosol being the largest in which a whole lot of different chemical reactions can occur. But that is separate uh, and separated by a membrane of the nucleus because the chemical reactions happening in the nucleus are going to be different to those happening in the cytosol. We also have ER, uh, site of uh, lipid production and protein production, the outer uh, membrane and inner membrane of the mitochondria determine what's called the intramembrane space. There's also uh, a space within that that's called the matrix. We've got ER, Golgi, lysosomes. So for example, um, in the rough ER, we're making protein. In the lysosomes, we're degrading protein. And those two uh, sets of enzymes are obviously having opposite reactions and need to be kept separate from each other. So one other uh, example then is to go a little bit deeper into this mitochondrial membrane. So we know that the mitochondria has two membranes, the outer membrane that faces the cytosol and the inner membrane that faces what we call the mitochondrial matrix. So by doing this, we actually create three chambers. One's the cytosol where certain reactions are happening. We create an intramembrane space and the matrix. So the way in which most ATP gets made by cellular respiration is this last stage of what we call the electron transport chain that has an enzyme in the membrane called ATP synthase. As the name suggests, this is where ATP is made. And we know that the production of ATP requires an input of energy. But where does the ATP energy actually come from? So during the electron transport chain, protons, hydrogen ions, um, are pumped into the intramembrane space. This creates a concentration gradient of a high concentration of protons up here and a low concentration down here. As those protons move through uh, ATP synthase, it uh, sort of cranks this round, turns it around, provides the energy for ADP and uh, phosphate to be combined to make ATP. So by having the internal membranes, we create a space where we can create a concentration gradient that can drive uh, this generator of ATP to make uh, the ATP molecule. The other important thing though uh, is about how fast that energy is released. So another reason for compartmentalization and control in cellular metabolism is about the release of energy. So a candle has a whole lot of stored energy in the bonds of the hydrocarbons that make up the wax. But when we burn a candle, we're only releasing a small amount of that energy at a time. Uh, you can compare and contrast this uh, with a stick of gunpowder or uh, firecracker here, where the energy that was released in the bonds of the um, gunpowder is all released at once, uh, leading to a whole lot of energy being released. 
So when we think about this, a candle will burn for hours, giving off a small amount of energy that can be used to light a room. Uh, whereas even if the same amount of energy is released from a firecracker, that will only be released within uh, a second or a split second. So for the cell to use energy from the molecules it gets, it would much rather do it in the candle way than the firecracker way. And apologies for the poor ant damage during that. So how does this work? Well, for each chemical reaction that's happening in metabolism, we might have a starting molecule and a product that's made with that reaction with its particular enzyme. The next stage in the process would have another enzyme and the next stage another one. So we don't just go straight from A to D. We have uh, intermediate chemicals along the way, each of them being made by their own enzyme. And they might not all be even in the same compartment. By doing it this way, we release a small amount of energy each time instead of all at once. Uh, and that allows most of that energy be to be captured and fed into the ATP production rather than it being lost as heat. So another way of showing this is that when we break down the bonds of sugar, we do it with lots of small little steps and each of that free energy being released is hopefully stored. It also reduces the size of the activation energy required each time. Whereas for instance, if we burn sugar, so this is the met metabolic way, this is the chemistry way, if we burn sugar in oxygen, it'll burn uh, with releasing a whole lot of light and heat, um, but requires a larger activation energy, and that energy that's released is lost, whereas in the biochemical way, uh, we can store that energy. The other important part of this topic is understanding uh, another effect on metabolism, which is how chemicals can affect uh, metabolic processes and cellular processes. And so chemicals that interfere with metabolism we often call drugs. Drugs might be medical drugs uh, or they might be illicit drugs. In this particular example uh, we're looking at the drug cocaine and how it affects um, production of uh, and release of uh, dopamine. So this cell is a nerve cell that's releasing dopamine uh, and that's picked up by the synapse on the other side, postsynaptic cell, that then conveys that signal. The presynaptic cell continues to release dopamine, which is normally taken up by these channels and then recycled and reused. But what uh, cocaine does, and that's what's shown here is the cocaine, it actually blocks off those channels. So normally when the presynaptic cell releases some uh, dopamine, that acts and then gets taken up and the signal goes away. When we block those channels for the reuptake of uh, dopamine, instead of going back inside the cell, it hangs around in the synapse, causing more signaling down here. And so that's one of the reasons that uh, taking cocaine increases euphoria, because the amount of dopamine in the presynaptic space is increased, and um, the time that it's there is increased as well. So more dopamine for longer, leading to that sensation. Unfortunately, uh, as with all addiction, is that continued high signal actually means that you get fewer receptors down here, um, and so the signal dampens down, and then no matter how much dopamine you release, there's no receptor to receive it, um, and so without the drug being present, you have a crash afterwards. So by adding this drug, we're changing the metabolism of the cells, changing how they operate. You actually uh, change protein production and where they are, and so the cell tries to return to normal. And so uh, all drugs, unfortunately, are going to lead to these sort of side effects as the cell compensates for the changes that are being made within it. Last of all, just quickly talking about uh, other drugs that and chemicals that might interfere with metabolism. We know that there are all sorts of drugs in agriculture, industrial waste, phytochemicals, pharmaceuticals and consumer products that get into our bodies and can affect cell metabolism. So uh, these chemicals are interfering with enzymes and other processes happening within the cell. When we want them to, we call them medicines. When we don't, we call them drugs and toxins. And so by interfering with uh, cellular processes, uh, they can have a whole lot of pathophysiological effects.